Good morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Chicago Online Worship. I'm the Reverend David Schwartz, co-minister here at First Unitarian, along with my spouse, Reverend Terry, and it is a pleasure to welcome you into worship this morning. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation. We're a community of children and youth and adults. We're a people of many beliefs and many traditions, and what unites us isn't that specific bullet list of the things that we believe, but the values that we share, which are expressed in different ways, and the mission that we share to grow our souls and to serve the world. Whether you're joining us online for the very first time, welcome, or whether you're joining us for the thousandth time, you're welcome here, you belong here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, or all of the time, or none of the time, you belong here. No matter how much money's in your pocket, no matter if you have a PhD, a GED, no degree, you belong here. We're a people of many races and many beliefs. We're a people of many genders and many sexual orientations. All of you is sacred. All of you is welcome. You belong here. It's a particular pleasure this morning to welcome our two guests to lead worship this morning, Virtus and Aaron. I have the honor, the pleasure of teaching the preaching class at Meadville Lombard, our theological school here in Chicago for Unitarian Universalist ministers. And I had the chance last year to have Virtus in my class, and in just a couple of weeks, Aaron will be in my class. In that role, I get to see some of our best and brightest preachers, sometimes years before congregations get to hear them. I know that hearing Virtus preach a year ago was such a pleasure that it's a gift to be able to share him and Aaron and their words today with all of you. I hope you'll join with me in the chat in giving them a warm, warm welcome. Friends, I invite you now to be present to this moment. Will you take a breath with me? And slow down and settle down and have another sip of coffee and enter into this service together as our prelude begins.
Let it be known to all the story of the glorious struggle of my people. Let it be known that black men and women helped to build this, our country. Let it be known that black men and women of the past, in an effort to make this country what it ought to be, gave up their very last to make America a real democracy, a true homeland for the free. Let our leaders of today go back into the past and come fighting forth and figured with the spirit of Turner and Vesey, Douglas, Tubman, and Truth. Let our stalwart black youth lift their heads in pride as they tell of their father's fight for freedom to the white youth by their side. Yes, let it be known. Let all the old folks tell of it. Sing it to the babes, yet in arms. Let us read the glorious story right along with our Bible. Let it be known to all the story of the glorious struggles of my people. Too long. Too long has it been kept from us. And now we will light our chalices, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, from Massachusetts and here in Vermont. And we invite you to light a chalice of your own wherever you are. We light this flame, an enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. I invite you now to join in the reciting of our covenant. The commitment that we make to each other about what it is we're doing here, why we gather, who we're becoming and who we are. Love is the spirit of this church and service is law. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. I invite you now to greet one another warmly in the chat box of friendship. Remembering it's public, say hello. Hello, my name is Virtus Robinson, and I want to tell you a story for all ages. When the children marched. In 1963, in Birmingham, Alabama's biggest city, many considered it the baddest city as well. From 1957 to 1963, there had been 18 bombings in Birmingham with no arrests. 
The black children of Birmingham felt oppressed at every turn, and in the spring of 1963, they played a pivotal role in restoring humanity to themselves and to a race divided America. They were trained in the strategy of passive resistance and motivated by their imaginations of a new world that they never knew, a world where all children are free. When the jails filled up with their parents and the adults, the children marched. Armed with the power of resistance, they marched for their freedom, they marched for justice, and they marched for their lives. But their passive resistance was met with violence, just like the adults. Dogs were sicked on them, water hoses sprayed on their bodies. Thousands of students were arrested. And as the world watched in sorrow on their televisions, those who were watching, including those in the White House, they inspired other children throughout the South to join in the crusade. They made a difference. What spurred thousands of children to action? The power of love. What gave them the power to rebel and resist? The power of love. How is it that children of all ages were the ones to garner the largest victory seen thus far in the civil rights movement? the power of love. For they realize that no child is free until all children are free. As Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, somehow we must be able to stand up before our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. When the children march. I invite you now to a spirit of prayer and meditation. Breathe a centering breath as you become present to this moment. While it has been over a week since the riots at the Capitol began, there is still much we bring to this space today. Fear and uncertainty about what will happen on Inauguration Day this Wednesday. Weariness and grief as we continue to experience loss due to the pandemic. And maybe even disappointment and sadness about the state of our country and of the world in this moment. Know that whatever it is you are carrying and bringing into this space today, you are not alone. This is a time where many of us are tending the wounds of grief and broken hearts. As part of our prayer today, I offer some words from Shirley Chisholm, the first African American woman elected to Congress in 1968. It is said that when she ran for president later in 1972, a reporter asked her why she was running for president, even though she wouldn't win. She responded, because I am in love with the America, the America that does not exist yet. I am in love with the America that does not exist yet. Our own heartbreak in this moment in history is because we too are in love with the America that does not exist yet. It may not exist anytime soon, but still today, we pray a prayer of active hope. Not the hope that is the passive, everything will be all right, but the hope that is a verb, an action, 
of holding the pain and grief of what is now, while also getting out of bed in the morning every day, even when the day is heavy. It is a hope that is not so much a light at the end of the tunnel, but is a match we light and cup with our own two hands, making our own light in the darkness. Our prayer today is one of that kind of hope, believing, dreaming in a better world, the world that we love but does not exist yet. In this church, our griefs, our joys, our hopes are shared by this community. I invite you now to share into the public chat anyone or anything that you want to be held in our love and care. Paul and Silas bound in jail had no money to go their bail. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on. Paul and Silas thought they were lost. The dungeon shook and the chains came off. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. keep your eyes on that prize, hold on, hold on, the only chain that a man can stand. Is that chain, O oh, hand in hand? Keep your eyes on that prize and hold on. Hold on. You know, the one thing we did right hey. was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on that prize. And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on that prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. prize and hold on. It is that time and that place by Kiyama Raman. Now is the time to call on the memories of the ancestors who thought they could not walk another step towards freedom, and yet they did. It is that time and place to call on the memories of the ancestors who, when the darkness of their lives threatened to take away the hope and light, reached a little deeper and prayed yet another prayer. It is that time and place to remember those who came through the long night to witness another sunrise. It is that time and place to remember the oceans of tears shed to deliver us to this time, to remember the bent knees and bowed backs, to remember the fervent voices asking, begging, and beseeching for loved ones sold off.
time to remember their laughter and joy, though they had far less and little reason for optimism, yet they stayed on the path towards a better day. Time to hold to the steadfast hands and hearts and prayers of the ancestors who brought us this far. Time to make them proud and show them and ourselves what we are made of. Time to show them that their prayers and sacrifices and lives were not in vain and did not go unnoticed, nor have they been forgotten. Did you know this day would come? Did you know that we would have to change places? Did you know that just as our ancestors were delivered, that you would also be delivered? Have you not seen the greatness and power of the creative energy in the universe called God that moves and has its being through human agency? Have you not seen God in your neighbor's faces, in the homeless, the battered woman in the trafficked child, the undocumented worker, the dispossessed. It is that time and that place to know that it is our turn, that we must leave a legacy for our children and all the children. It is that time and that place. We are the ones we've been waiting for. For that, let us be eternally grateful. Amen and blessed be. Morally, I was led to nonviolence because I felt that it was the best moral way to deal with the problem. We were seeking to establish a just society, and uh, it was my feeling then and it is my feeling now that uh, violence is certainly much more uh, socially destructive and it creates many more social problems than it solves. So I was led to nonviolence for deep moral reasons, and I turned to it because I felt that it was the morally excellent way to deal with the problem of racial injustice in our country. There is no freedom, the wise men said, let justice roll down, roll down when the Cry out for shelter and bread Let justice roll down like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you get We re-walk together Believe in the dream When the way gets rough We'll make a new way Let justice roll down like a mighty stream Hatred will never drive out hate Let love roll down, roll down Remember our hearts can make us great Let love roll down like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you get We re-walk together Believe in the dream When the way gets rough We'll make a new way let your love roll down like a mighty stream When brutality threatens our daughters and sons Let peace roll down, roll down May our voices rise up louder than the guns Let peace roll down like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you get we re-walk Together, believe in the dream When the way gets rough We'll make a new way And let peace roll down Like a mighty stream Step by step One by one Let justice roll down Roll down They can kill the prophet but the dream lives on Let justice roll down Like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you get me We walk together Believe in 
come true When the way gets rough, we'll make a new way Let just a swing down like a pine tree to it because I felt that it was the morally excellent way to deal with the problem of racial injustice in our country. My name is Erin Victoria Scott and I am a seventh generation Unitarian Universalist on the Universalist side. Growing up, I was told of the great deeds of the UU movement as a whole and the parts my family played in that movement. For example, one of the branches of my family founded a Universalist congregation in Camp Hill, Alabama in the 1800s. That congregation became the largest Universalist church in the southeastern United States in the first half of the 20th century. My great-grandmother, Mary Slaughter, who grew up in that church in Camp Hill, was so well known in the Universalist Church throughout the country for her work in religious education that when she married Reverend Clinton Scott, who was a Universalist minister from Vermont, he was known as Mary Slaughter's husband. A lesser man might have been insecure to have a wife more famous than himself in the 1930s, but Mary and Clinton were what we might now call a power couple. They were so outspoken about religious freedom, education, and racial injustice that the Ku Klux Klan burned crosses on their lawn. When Mary and Clinton lived in Peoria, Illinois, Clinton's preaching drew the wrath of Al Capone, and the mob threatened to kidnap their son Peter, my grandfather. So Clinton and Mary sent Peter to live with Mary's mother in Camp Hill, where he would be safely out of reach of Al Capone. In my early 20s, I struck out on a circuitous road trip across the United States, and since I would be passing through Alabama, I asked my grandfather where to find the church my ancestors had built. Where was the farm where he spent some of his childhood? Where was my great-grandmother and her family buried? What I learned shocked me, though it should not have. I had just never put the pieces together. But when he used the word plantation, it all suddenly snapped into place. I was in my 20s. With all of the family stories I'd been told, how could this massive fact that I was the descendant of slave owners have never been said or acknowledged? I, I tried to stay calm and just let this new information sink in as my grandfather continued to tell me stories of his childhood. He told me about a, a little girl that he was friends with and played with every day, but they couldn't have lunch together because she had to eat in the kitchen and he had to eat out in the dining room. My grandfather had no specific directions for my journey, just the name of the town with our church at its center. My grandfather told me the plantation house had long ago been swallowed by kudzu, but I might be able to find its front steps. He said they had a distinctive shape, but honestly, I didn't have the courage to look for them on that trip. When I had asked him about the family grave plot, he again couldn't give me any specific directions, but assured me that it wouldn't be too hard to find. He said, you're related to all the white people in town and half the black ones, just ask somebody. I don't know for sure, but Considering interracial marriage was not legal in Alabama until 1967, the implication here is that my apparently many African-American relatives are the descendants of slave mothers raped by my ancestors. My road trip took on a feeling of a pilgrimage found the family grave plot and walked among their graves and read aloud the names on the stones. I thought about how very different my life is from theirs. And I prayed for God to forgive them. I prayed for God to help me to forgive them. As I knelt in the cold, dry grass by their stones, I vowed to do everything I could with my one little life to undo what harm they have done. 
So when Virtus and I were preparing our first service together a year ago, he asked me, how do you engage with your family history? And today I want to ask you that same question. We all have our own mythology, stories we tell about ourselves, about who we are as a person, a family, a congregation, a nation. There are parts of our history that we like to, need to, lift up, to celebrate, to emulate, to say, this is America, for example, and other parts of our stories that we would rather ignore, turn away from, or deny entirely, because they are painful truths. It is confusing to be proud of and ashamed of the same people, to have universalist ministers who were slave owners. But shame and denial will not help us heal. We can't change the past, but we have a responsibility to engage with our past. In order to get out of this mess, we have to take an honest look at ourselves. In the spirit of the third principle, acceptance of one another and engagement to spiritual growth, I would like to share with you six key practices that I use to stay in right relation. One, learn the history of our country that was not taught in schools. Two, seek out contemporary stories, the experiences of people who are classified by society as other from me and therefore experience the world very differently than I do. And three, believe them. Four, I make a habit to take direction from and follow the leadership of the descendants of slaves. This helps me stay in right relation. Five, I try to rescue my ethnicity from generic whiteness by learning about and expressing the culture of my specific European heritage. I can help break down the supremacy and normalization of generic white culture. And six, I try to actively engage with dismantling of society's structures of oppression and actively construct new systems of reparation that will eventually lead to equity. Okay, we may journey to the valley of shadow and death for a little while, but I promise to bring us out of it. One of the writings that helped me to navigate from my African-American Holiness Pentecostal upbringing to universalism was Bishop Carlton Pearson's Gospel of Inclusion. But I could not grapple with the concept of a hellless afterlife. The concept of evildoers and sinners being dragged, kicking and screaming into heaven <laughs> just didn't sit well with me, especially after reaching, I mean, researching my family history. My ancestral journey took me to the red clay of Southwest Georgia, literally to an area named Red Hill. I can smell the red clay right now on my grandmother's farm. For it was on that hill that my great great grandfather Reuben Walls was born and he was born enslaved. My grandmother told me how when Reuben was nine years old and was working in the fields and all of the enslaved people on the Walls plantation were called to the gathering place in the middle of the slave quarters. I don't know if you can tell I'm sitting, but I'm pretty short. <laughs> I'm about 5'2", and he was short like me. So he came to the front so that he could see. And when he got to the front, he saw his mother. She was tied to a post, naked. And without words, the slave master proceeded to whip her and whip her and whip her until the blood ran down her back. And she died in front of her children. 
You see, red hills, red clay, had more than iron in it. And as a Unitarian Universalist, I often think about if I were to see that man in heaven, that man that murdered my ancestor, what would I say to him? <laughs> what would I say? What would I ask him? And you know what? I would ask him, what was her name? What was her name? We don't even know her name. No burial site, no tombstone, just the painful memories of her son, my great-great-grandfather, who only knew her as Mama. I want to know her name so that I can honor her and her blood that flows in my veins so that I can lay my burdens down by the riverside and study war no more, as the old African-American spiritual says. Because burden, that burden, has plagued my family till this very day. For I thought I knew what the spiritual that I had grew up singing meant. Don't study war, don't fight battles, let God fight your battles or someone else for that matter. War is a burden, fighting is a burden. Let someone else study war. Let someone else fight battles, lay down those burdens. But that study, that concept awoken something in me not really a spirit of pacifism, but I know now that I have to study war. I have to take up my sword and shield. I have to carry a heavy load. I have to carry the burdens. I have to carry the burdens of truth, of honor, the burdens of justice, the burdens of right versus wrong, to war against poverty, to war against racism, to war against inequality, tyranny, exclusivity, homophobia. We must study war with the hopes and belief that once the battle is won, once the wars are over and we are victorious, once we have eliminated poverty, from our communities, once we have eliminated racism, inequality, tyranny from our world, then we are going to study war no more because we won't have to. There will be nothing to fight, no burdens to carry. We will be able to study war no more. You see, this interpretation speaks to who we are, the ways that we fight for social justice. We can do it passively, but not by bowing down to it. We can do it politically, but not by bowing down to it. We can do it through protest, but not by bowing down to it. We can do it through service, good deeds, being inclusive, being thoughtful, mindful, but not to give up just yet, but thinking about the end goal that we can study war no more. What a beautiful day that that will be. That Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of the children of former slaves and slave owners will be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood. Today, I would say the table of humanity. That would be a dream realized rather than a dream deferred. But we are not done yet. So let that dream motivate you to action. Let that hope keep you in the trenches because we are building a new way. We are working to be free. We can feed our every need as peace and freedom is our cry. Let that power of love be the doctrine of our church. And let our service to the earth, to the world, to each other, be its prayer. Be encouraged and blessed be. Are building a new way. We are building a new.
Spirit of life and love, dear God of all nations, there is so much work to do. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Help us hold fast to our vision of what can be. May we see the hope in our history and find courage and the voice to work for that constant rebirth of freedom and justice. That is our dream. Amen. I extend a warm thank you to our pulpit guests today, Aaron Scott and Virtus Robinson, seminarians at Meadville Lombard Theological School. I have the privilege of serving as chaplain to the students at Meadville Lombard, our seminary right here in Chicago. It has been a joy to see worship led by the seminarians there, including Aaron and Virtus, as they have led us in worship for faculty, staff, and their fellow students. I extend a warm thank you as well to our musicians and all of those who have made today's King service possible. And that includes you, our members and friends. Our congregation is entirely self-supporting from donations from members and friends, just like you. Everything you see here from the physical plant to our ministries, to those seeds that have yet to take root for future possibilities are financially made possible by we, the congregation. On the next screens, you'll see it, the ways that you could give to the church, either on a one-time basis or as a pledge. If you are not yet a pledging member or friend, I heartily ask you to consider making an annual gift to the church. This can be paid quarterly or month to month on an automatic debit basis, which makes it easy, nothing to remember, but you know that you're doing your part to share your treasure to make this church a viable, community for progressive religious faith now and into the future. I invite you to give as generously as you are able and may this congregation be worthy of your gifts. Our worship is over. Our service begins. Go forth in peace and be a blessing to the world. Amen.